Hello, my name is Merida Campbell and I'm the head, the acting head of curatorial at Sydney Living Museums. Welcome to today's Discover SLM talk and I extend a particularly warm welcome to our members, donors and supporters. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and currently work. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Curators at SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we'll be sharing some of this research with you as we explore a range of subjects from food to furnishing textiles, from celebrity marriages to colonial bungalows. Join me every Tuesday at 4 to 4.30 to hear our curators delve into a new topic. Today's speaker is Michael Lake, a curator at Sydney Living Museums with special responsibility for the Caroline Simpson Library and Research Collection. Michael curated the exhibition, Marion Hall Best, Interiors, and co-curated with Megan Martin, Dream Home, Small Home, on Australia's housing crisis following World War II. Michael has written and presented on various aspects of the history of houses, interiors and domestic furnishings in Australia, including authoring a book on the extensive wallpaper collection at Caroline Simpson Library and research collection. He is also engaged in ongoing research into the rise and development of Australia's department stores and furnishing trade. If you have any questions for Michael, please add them to the Zoom chat and he will answer them at the end of this talk. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Nerida. And I'll just share my screen. So our homes of the past were not without colour, of course, but sometimes we only see the past in black and white. Take a look at this photo of a section of the drawing room at Beaulieu in Turak. Victoria around 1898. Quite a wealthy interior owned by the Buckley family. And when visited soon after this photo was taken by a journalist, he wrote this. It is a pity of pities that we have not yet reached the days of color photography. For if that were so, our readers would then be enabled to form some idea of the grandeur of this room, bright with color, everywhere, and yet toned with that good taste and artistic skill that are only to be accomplished by the hand of a master of the art. So bright with colour everywhere, but how would you know looking at this black and white photo? And what were these bright colours? The writer doesn't say, the interior remains colourless. It can, of course, be a difficult task to understand the domestic world lived in by our ancestors, especially regarding colour. Even though the historic houses managed by Sydney Living Museums do their best to present and interpret houses of different eras, after all, colour can fade over time. Furnishings become tired and dull. Many textiles, wallpapers and other furnishings of the past were light sensitive and discoloured over time. In addition, interiors of the 19th and first part of the 20th centuries can seem quite over furnished to our 21st century eyes, so our judgment can be clouded. There is though no doubt that some dull colors or neutrals, even beige, were popular in certain periods. In the 1930s and 40s, there was a fashion for interiors that used quite a deal of beige. This colour illustration on the left is from a booklet produced in 1940 by a company selling wallpaper with real samples of the wallpapers illustrated on the right. And though the interior seems quite stylish when new and fresh in this illustration, it's not difficult to imagine how cheerless it may look when faded and worn, very beige. So colour in the domestic world can be complex this booklet is just one of many resources in the Carolyn Simpson Library and Research Collection, where I work, that help us to reveal and understand a little bit more about colour in our homes in the 19th and the first part of the 20th century. And this presentation will show other resources from the library that will hopefully help us a little more. 
back to photography of interiors. Even into the 1950s and 60s, serious architectural photography, especially of modernist interiors, was usually associated with black and white photography. But how different it all looks in color. Of course, popular home magazines were produced at least partly in color by this period. And the lack of color was not practical for practitioners like interior designers. In this case, this interior was designed by Marion Hall Best in 1953. Best prided herself on how she used colour and it was important to show her work in colour to potential clients. Of course, anyone trying to promote colour might go out of their way to try to reproduce it, whether they be interior designers like Marion, product manufacturers, magazines and journals. This photo of a dining alcove at Rip and Lee in Melbourne from 1903 shows an incredibly lush wall and ceiling covering. When huge expense was being outlaid on redecoration of this house in 1897 for the Sargood family, a journal at the time reported on some of the work stating that the best artistic decorative wallpaper is to be used and the architects are procuring the most modern designs of this from Europe. Unfortunately, there is no report found of what wall covering was selected or its color. But I can tell you that it is definitely an embossed wall covering of which there were many varieties at the time with brand names like Lincrusta and Anaglypta and other types like Japanese leathers. And the fashion of the day if you were reasonably wealthy, meant that the raised areas, the embossed areas of the wall covering were likely to be gilt. And the ground color may have been a deep color, like a deep red or a green. A journal of the day illustrated how Japanese leathers embossed wall coverings may have looked in a room together with some very Japanese inspired furnishings, which were then highly fashionable. This of course may change your idea on how the original room may have looked in color. Getting the sense of the color and texture of at least some of the furnishings in a black and white room can of course change our perspective on the space. Such as this example, Look at this photo of a drawing room at Montpellier in the Sydney suburb of Randwick, as illustrated in the book, Our Beautiful Homes. By chance, the Carolyn Simpson Library holds in its collection a matching wallpaper, which, well, certainly brightens up the room. Again, gilt highlights have been used on this paper, which have would have produced different effects at different times of day, especially at night when internal lights, which were not as bright as they are today, would help give the room a soft glow. Of course, this wallpaper was used on the lower part of the wall, the dado. And specialist publications of the day were produced for architects and builders to demonstrate some of the later styles, like this one called Colour Studies from 1892, which showed the fashion for what was called tripartite design in the last quarter of the 19th century. That is, dividing the wall up into three with a frieze, a fill and a dado, which might be painted or wallpapered or a combination of both. And the colours in this period altered often in favor of what were known as secondary or tertiary colors. And you get a sense of them in these illustrations, browns, olives, bluey greens, making some interiors and furnishings look perhaps less vivid than say earlier in the century, say in the middle of the 19th century. Like this wallpaper made about 1850. 
And with wallpaper, like this one, you didn't need to be wealthy to afford it. Especially after about 1840, when production was mechanized, the version of blue used here was actually very popular and commonly used in middle and working class homes in the mid 19th century. This particular sample of wallpaper was actually found during renovations of a very modest sized workers' cottage in the Sydney suburb of Piermont, depicted in the photo at left. The wallpaper came from a house in the middle, the small house in the front room. After the mechanization of the wallpaper and textile industries in the early 19th century, production boomed. And the result was a huge number of new designs available at modest prices. And there was another result, the rise of the design critic. Some who were scathing of the quality of new designs being produced. One such critic was Henry Cole, the first director of the Victorian Albert Museum in London, and also the editor of this journal, the Journal of Design and Manufacturers, produced just for three years, 1849 to 1852. It featured over 200 real tipped in or stuck in wallpaper and textile swatches, which were usually accompanied by editorial commentary by Cole, explaining their design and color qualities or limitations as it may be. For us, it provides a wonderful resource of real fabrics and wallpapers produced in the mid 19th century that have generally, generally retained much of their original color with little fading, often showing the popularity of stronger colors. But when most of us consider colour in the home now, we may, of course, think of house paint and therefore paint charts. This is one produced by the company Borthwicks and according to the blurb on the front, was manufactured expressly for the Australian climate. This one is from the 1930s. But ready mix paints, began to appear in the late 19th century and with them, paint charts. In Australia, a sizable paint manufacturing industry also developed around World War I. During the course of the 20th century, the number of shades available and size of paint charts increased as did technological innovations. In 1929, another company, the British Australian lead manufacturers, began production of a new range for use as car paint. These paints proved to be so good at maintaining their true color in the harsh Australian conditions that the company diversified into house paints, calling their range the Dulux 388 brushing line, which is as seen on the screen. The painter's art and craft of the 19th century is also represented in other ways beyond just plain colour. One skill expected of painters in the 19th century was the ability to marble and grain. In other words, produce faux marble or timber grain finishes to cover an original surface finish, sometimes on different types of surfaces altogether or on the same surface, such as an oak grain on a pine door. And from this treatise on screen, on this section of the painter's craft, which was issued in multiple parts in 1857-58, I'm showing you an example of marbling. There was of course a particular Victorian era fashion and love of imitating surfaces. The one way this was employed was, in, was particularly, it seems, in entrance halls of uh, wealthier or middle-class homes, which were sometimes decorated as if they were made from marble, particularly Sienna marble, it seems, that was a favorite. The entrance hall at Rouse Hill House of, is of course an example of this. This publication on marbling and graining is one of a number of treaties or handbooks issued in the 19th century 
for different trades, dealing with furniture, furnishings, decorating. Another example is George Smith's The Cabinet Maker and Upholsterer's Guide from 1826. <clears throat> this volume includes a number of colour plates showing window treatments, in this case, obviously for wealthier clients, these are very fancy, hand colored plates, as these are hand colored, are not necessarily common in this period, but were obviously necessary in some handbooks like this one to inform upholsterers and decorators of the period about different colors, types of fabrics for curtains and valances. And for us, it's another invaluable guide, not just of textile colors, but also color combinations. Later in the 19th century, and for much of the 20th, one of the most useful sources of information about colour in the home are trade catalogues. Catalogues produced by manufacturers or retailers. Because catalogues were essentially selling tools, it was of the benefit of manufacturers or retailers to reproduce their wares in colour where possible whether they were floor coverings like linoleum on the left or half tiles on the right. In this case, from the Potteries District of England, where tiles were imported into Australia in the hundreds of thousands. By the 1880s, relatively new chromolithographic printing process allowed good color reproductions that were not too expensive to be made up into catalogue form. And to us today, they are an essential resource to understand choices for colour in the home. <coughs> Even in the bathroom, <coughs> especially after they began to be plumbed into wealthier or even middle-class homes. The photo on the right <coughs> of the bathroom at the mansion Swifts Sorry. At Darling Point in Sydney, shows a, a shower bath cubicle with faux marble decoration on the outside. And this encasing was probably made of timber. For the catalogue on the left, a similar shaped shower bath called the spray and plunge bath is in this case made of enamel metals and with a different decorative exterior, of course. But according to the catalogue text, fulfills the sanitary requirements of the age in that there is an entire absence of wood enclosure. The Swift's bathroom was clearly passe. Department stores were also large scale producers of catalogues that by the 20th century started to have more color reproductions, such as in the image on the right from the Sydney department store, Marcus Clark. The bedroom on the left <coughs> is one from an album of photos of Brooksby in a Sydney suburb of Double Bay taken around 1922. And the photo is captioned as the pink bedroom. Without any other clues as to what the room may have looked like in color, I came across the illustration at right from Marcus Clark. Is this the shade of pink that might have been present at Brooksby? It's at least a clue. And in the sitting room at Brooksby on the right, once you start looking closely, you will notice quite a number of soft furnishings draped and placed around the room on the piano in the foreground, bolsters on the chairs. There was of course something of a fashion for bright silks and art silks for cushions, bolsters, table runners in the 1920s home and the art furnishings illustrated in this Grace Brothers department store catalog on the left, give us some idea of the types available and fashionable at the time. By this era, the 1920s, modernist ideas on color also started to have an influence. Although color theories and the effects of color on human perception had been discussed for many decades before this, Ideas on how colour might be used in the home started being taught in schools or colleges aimed at interior designers. 
such as the East Sydney Technical College in the 1930s and 40s under the tutelage of Phyllis Schillito. This slide shows part of an archive of works from a student, Helen Burgess, who attended East Sydney Technical College in the 1940s. It demonstrates two of the colour theories taught, the Schillito wheel and the Munsell wheel, as well as a watercolour of a bedroom, Helen's attempt to use some of her training in a pr proposed interior scheme. There is also from a this period, um, discussion of colour in interiors spilled over from classrooms, artists and decorators into popular magazines of the period and books such as Margaret Lord's Interior Decoration, a guide to furnishing the Australian home from 1944. And the discussion amongst interior designers and others was not just about colour combinations or aesthetics, but, but about what colours work best in the harsh Australian light? And were these different colours than, say, in Northern Europe? And also about the psychological effects of colour on occupants of the house. Did some colours, for example, create positive energy and others negative? Even though a lot has changed since the 1940s and our home interiors may look very different now, some of, some of these debates are still with us today. But most importantly, I think, is that with a few resources from the past, from the, the Carolyn Simpson Library, we can stop seeing the domestic world of the past in black and white. We have the tools to interpret the interiors of the past as more than just a sea of beige. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. That's fascinating. How well did Australia keep up with the trends from the UK, the USA and Europe in terms of colour schemes in the home? Um, I think they were, um, they kept up very closely. Um, there were a lot of um, magazines and books, uh, you know, libraries were very popular as, uh, and schools uh, where uh, students could learn about the latest trends and the latest designs. Um, so Australia certainly wasn't behind the times. I mean, you know, as long as it took um, a journal to uh, reach Australia, you know, five or six weeks or whatever it was on the boat, it would be uh, available here pretty much. Um, having said that, um, there's not necessarily a lot of debate about should Australian interiors look different to, say, home, which is what many people call called England in the 19th century. Um, okay, I'll just have a look at some of the questions that we've got coming through from our viewers. Um, so Hayley asked, how can you view some of the colour illustrations and other resources from the Caroline Simpson Library that you showed in the presentation? Uh, there are some that are available on the Sydney Living Museum website if you, if you look. Um, under research and collections. Um, <clears throat> there are also uh, some of the trade catalogues I mentioned to and patent books have been fully digitized. Um, they are available on the internet archive and also via our uh, library catalog. Uh, and there's more of them coming as well. So in the future, we're going to digitize even more so there'll be more resources. Fantastic, thank you. Catherine's got a couple of questions for you, Michael. Um, first of all, she pointed out the um, interesting non-poisonous paint claim when they would have contained lead, that that was a slightly outrageous claim. Um, what were the kinds of poisons you might expect in a house paint during that period? Um, I think there was poisons in <laughs> an awful lot of paints and wallpapers and textiles, the pigments used um, <clears throat> were often ones that we wouldn't uh, use today. Uh, the obvious one, of course, is, is arsenic in green colored um, uh, paints and wallpapers and textiles. Um, but there were a lot of other fairly dodgy chemicals being used. Um, and so <laughs> lead was not 
sort of considered one of those at the time, but obviously uh, ideas have changed on those things. They have. Catherine's also got a question about Scagliola marble clad. Um, was it used as a residential application? Uh, um, yeah, most, most of those service treatments were used um, in um, domestic interiors, but um, it just depended on the cost. If the cost was, you know, high, then obviously it's more limited, so it could be more of, a, you know, for a wealthy interior. But yes, I mean, they they were used in in all sorts of domestic uh, interiors. Now, Mel's got a question again about the poisonous paint. Um, and she's asking, are there any dangerous colours in the CSLRC, such as wallpaper samples? Um, well, dangerous, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, the, the definition of dangerous is, is, is difficult to, you know, uh, sort of get, get your uh, head around in the sense that um, if you're, if you have like say a wallpaper, for instance, or a paint sample that's enclosed in a piece of plastic, then it's not necessarily dangerous. If you don't move it around, you don't sort of, you know, ingest the fumes or <laughs> start um, licking it or whatever you want to do, you know. Um, so they these surfaces um, like arsenic, for instance, like, you know, obviously that was probably the most dangerous chemical, uh, but it wasn't necessarily dangerous in the 19th century unless you had certain climatic conditions that made it more dangerous. Um, so that might have involved um, uh, humid conditions um, and uh, combinations of uh, certain type of glues that were used in the wallpaper. It's a different a combination of different things created the, the danger. Um, so, yes, so, I mean, you wouldn't, for a lot of the wallpapers or, or paint samples or textiles, you wouldn't necessarily rub your hands all over them and then go and eat a sandwich. You would, you know, wash your, your hands and all of that. <laughs> um, but they're not necessarily, you know, outrageously dangerous like, say, the uh, arsenic might have been, but even then, you, you need certain conditions for them to become particularly uh, worrying. Obviously, we have safe handling standards yes. within our collections for this kind of material. Alistair has asked, Michael, how do you date a colour card? Most manufacturers don't seem to include dates on their trade material. Um, that's a good question. And dating a lot of uh, the colour cards, um, trade catalogues, a lot of um, manufacturers didn't include dates. And one of the reasons they didn't was simply because they didn't, uh, they wanted to maybe reissue the, the, the item over two or three or more years. Uh, sometimes they would issue the item and then produce a separate price list which had a date on it. So determining the date can be difficult. Um, you have to use all your wits and all your research skills, um, including looking um, on places like the Trove newspaper database, for instance, for ads, um, home magazines and you know, house magazines. Um, you uh, use your, your judgment sometimes on uh, <clears throat> what similar uh, you know, publications may, may look like. So you might be able to get a, a rough date from, from other similar publications that are dated. Um, some catalogues and some um, paint charts are dated, but not all of them. So it's, it's not a problem with everyone, but it is a problem with some. And of course, you can always ask the helpful staff at the Caroline Simpson Library if you are struggling with those dates. They've got so much experience in delving into those areas and lots of resources available too. 
that's all we've got time for today in terms of the questions. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Next week at four o'clock, it's going to be me speaking to you about the shady ladies of um, Sydney's underworld during the roaring 20s, looking at how all of the changes that occurred during the 20s impacted on the female felons. Some of them are the well-known like Kate Lee and some uh, people you've never heard of before. So I hope you can join me at four o'clock next Tuesday for that talk. Thanks, Michael. I hope you all have a great evening.